Okay, so now we have a star that uh, has left the main sequence. It's been fusing uh, helium to heavier elements. And of course, then uh, it's going to run out of helium. So as it runs out of helium in the core, it collapses. This is the core that does this. The core collapses. Um, and gets dense and hot enough to burn even heavier. Now, depending on the mass of the star, it repeats this process. Okay, so this process right here, then it's gonna burn the next thing, and then after that, it's gonna run out of that one, core collapses, the outer parts expand even more. It can become even what's called a red super giant because it's even bigger. But in any case, this process repeats and repeats some more. So at some point then, uh, the star is going to be left with a number of shells. Now this depends on how massive it is, but in the end it's going to have Lots of different shells of different things right here that are burning. Okay, so your star itself is going to have lots of different things. So for example, there's still gonna be some hydrogen uh, to helium that's burning here. Here you're gonna have some helium to other things. But in the end, you're gonna be left with just iron. This is the key thing here. Okay, so it goes up to iron. In other words, this is the symbol is Fe, it's element number 26, as we talked about in nuclear physics. This tells us that this is uh, the 26th um, element in the periodic table. This tells us the number of protons it has. 56 is the number of nucleons, uh, and that's the key thing here. For some reason, this right here seems to be the maximum uh, thing that stars can make naturally. In other words, after this, in the core, um, it's not energetically favorable to fuse iron. Remember the reason why, so this right here, this is the limit in a steady, stable, burning star. Do you remember this uh, binding energy per nucleon? We had this graph that I showed you before. This is the number of nucleons. I call this the whale. I don't know if you remember this, but we were looking at this in the uh, nuclear physics uh, topic from the core. This was this one right here. This is the peak right here at 56. This is iron 56. Now what happens is, we talked about this before. I'm just gonna label this right here. Hopefully you can read it. Um, this is the peak. Uh, and remember what we were talking about before is that in order to have um, a process that's energetically favorable, the reactants, which is in this case the things that are, you're, you're fusing, um, and then when you compare that to the products, which are the things that are remaining, the products need to have a higher binding energy per nucleon than the uh, reactants. So in this case right here, after you reach, uh, in other words, so you can go from hydrogen to helium, that's fine. You're allowed to go sort of up the hill, that's fine. No problem up until you reach iron. At that point, no I mean, you're at the peak of the binding energy per nucleon, which means it's not energetically favorable. In other words, iron does not want to fuse to make something else because it's not going to be energetically easy to do. It'll be very difficult for it to do it. So what happens then? Well, then we have this limit, and it depends on the mass of the star. So if the mass of the core, this is the key thing here. So this right here, this will be a final collapse. Okay, so this right here goes up to this right here. After that, it collapses. This is the core collapses, I mean. Now, when the core collapses its last time, it all depends on what that core mass is. So if the core mass, so we'll say um, if m is less than, uh, this is the magic number actually here, it's 
solar masses. And we normally write like this. We normally say M with a little uh, circle with a dot in the middle. That actually means solar masses. So what this means is if the core, if the leftover, what's remaining in the core here, if uh, that mass is less than 1.4 times the current mass of the sun, uh, then it becomes a white dwarf and dies. So this is what's going to happen to our sun. Our sun's going to eventually become a white dwarf. And that's because, well, by definition, its own mass, I mean, it's burning uh, material, so it's going to have less and less mass. It's getting lighter, so to speak, as it, uh, as it goes ahead and burns through its hydrogen right now. So, of course, its own mass cannot possibly be 1.4 times its current mass later when it has even less. So our star, unfortunately, I suppose, is going to end up just being a, a little old white dwarf that's going to die quietly. Um, this number right here, by the way, this is called the Chandrasekhar limit. But if the mass is greater than 1.4 solar masses, then you get a supernova explosion. This is key here. And then it either makes a neutron star or black hole, which I think is really cool. Um, so that's the end result, depending on what its mass is. So here's what really happens. In that last collapse, what ends up happening then is we have what's called uh, electron degeneracy pressure. That's a term that the, uh, the syllabus says you're supposed to learn, but something a bit advanced that actually has to do with quantum mechanics and not being allowed to have two different states uh, in the same energy level. But basically, it's a matter of just kind of packing uh, materials. So at some point, you know, once the core collapses, the core goes ahead and tries to collapse. And in this case right here, because of uh, electron degeneracy pressure, it's called, in other words, you can't squish it anymore. And so what tends to happen is, um, well, two things. If it doesn't have much mass, it just collapses to that and then basically makes a neutron, uh, sorry, then it just makes a white dwarf. So that's just going to be a boring little uh, white dwarf that just ends up dying. But if it has enough mass, in other words, if its mass is greater than 1.4 times the solar mass, this greater than the Chandrasekhar limit, uh, that's named after an Indian um, astrophysicist. He was really clever. He did a lot of stuff, this Chandrasekhar. But um, if the mass is greater than that, what happens is this. As it uh, goes through, um, as the uh, material tries to collapse, what happens is this electron degeneracy pressure ends up uh, making the material essentially bounce. So imagine it's a free fall collapse. It hits this sort of limit and basically bounces off. And that bouncing off, that's actually the supernova explosion. It's super fast, it's extremely energetic, and it's very, very bright. So we see these things as a really bright flash in the sky. It makes these beautiful slow explosions. If you ever look up a picture of um, the Crab Nebula, for example, uh, that's a picture of a very old supernova, happened over a thousand years ago. And, um, well, around a thousand, not over, but uh, around a thousand years ago, the supernova actually happened. And now it has this beautiful sort of aftermath of an explosion. So there's lots of clouds and stuff. So when it does this supernova explosion, then what's remaining in the core is one of two things. If it's, uh, you know, pretty massive, but not that much more than that, it's going to make what's called a neutron star. And a neutron star will be just that. It's mainly neutrons. It's going to be extremely dense. Like a tiny little teaspoon of that stuff would weigh like, uh, like a, a giant building. So, I mean, you could not possibly stand on that. You'd be completely squished. And neutron stars also spin extremely fast. It's a little bit like uh, if you imagine a figure skater, you know, who starts spinning, you know, as they start going around with their arms out. What happens then is uh, as they bring their arms in, uh, conservation of angular momentum is going to mean they're going to spin faster. Well, this neutron star is spinning mega fast. So they spin sometimes many times per second. So these guys really spin fast.
And of course, uh, as they're spinning through some really complicated effects, they actually tend to give off these big pulses of energy, these pulses of light. So um, those pulses, basically, they precess, so they sort of, they sort of it's like a, light, uh, like a lighthouse, essentially. And that thing right there, so neutron stars are what are called pulsars. And that's because uh, any neutron star should make a pulsar. It just depends on how it's pointed to us. So if it's just going like this, not pointing to us, if it's just sort of flashing like this, we're just going to see a neutron star, nothing special. But if that neutron star happens to be angled to where, you know, as it precesses, that little pulse sort of runs into us, it goes around, runs into us, goes around, runs into us, we're going to see a pulse of very energetic uh, light. So those are what we call pulsars. So pulsars are technically uh, neutron stars just lined up to us. And a black hole is if it's even more massive, it does really crazy weird stuff. It makes what's called a black hole, which causes a singularity in space-time. And it's something that's not extremely well understood. But uh, basically it uh, can make this big crazy black hole. If it's extra super duper massive, it'll do this. So that's essentially what happens.